we're, uh, we're wrapping up with investigation this week, yeah? That factor of awakening. Yeah, the factor of awakening, investigation, which is, again, one of those, um, it's, um, it's understood differently in, 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 in our culture, what investigation means, yeah? Um, investigation for us is, why did this happen? Where did it come from? How do I sort it out? How do I figure it out? How do I think more about it? You know, analyze it, you know, try to, you know, thoughtfully, thoughtfully analyze it, consider where it came from, yeah, and so forth. It's not at all what uh, investigation is in, in, the, in the Buddhist, uh, in, in this way, in a mindful way. Um, uh, investigation here is always about investigating the structure of the mind, not the content of the mind. And it takes a really long time. It takes quite a while to really get this, you know, uh, to the point where in meditation, you're actually doing this kind of investigation. Because we're, again, it's just our conditioning. Our conditioning is it's all about our stories and our thought world. And like I've said to you many times before, we come to the practice having taking refuge in thinking, not in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, in thinking. That's our go-to. That's our go-to. And so investigation, of course, is more thinking about what's going on and how I can do it, figure it out, you know, how I can figure it out and resolve it, you know, sort it out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the investigation here is in, in, into the structure of the mind. And the, one of the first aspects of that is investigation into the way we are uh, participating in uh, uh, keeping our own dukkha around in co-creating dukkha, you know, uh, moment, moment to moment in these small ways, uh, in these small ways. And we're doing all day long. Uh, in, in some ways, we are adding to the dukkha uh, and not necessarily seeing that clearly, not necessarily seeing, oh, oh, this is what's going on and this is what has contributed to it, you know? With, for example, in the Buddha sense, it wouldn't be like, <clears throat> say you find yourself in a mood, right? Now, if we were going to investigate in a Western way, we'd say, where does this mood coming from? What contributed to the mood? What was the proximate cause? What was the near, you know, what was the near cause of it, right? Why? It didn't because it didn't come out of the blue. Nothing comes out of the blue from a Buddhist point of view. It always is cause and effect. Always cause and effect. But often, we're not looking closely at enough to see what the what the cause might be, you know? But part of it would be, oh, I know something happened this morning. It reminded me of something uh, that my mother used to say to me, which really pushed my buttons. And that's why my buttons are being pushed. And that's why I'm in a mood, you know? Oh, I see. That's why, that's why it is. From the Buddhist angle, it's like, that's, that's interesting, but that's not where we're going at all. It's more like, Notice how whatever thought is going on in the mind around that, notice what's going on in the body at the same time. Notice it. And notice how another thought comes to reinforce the mood. Notice how you are reinforcing the mood with by the, the, but with, by the next thought and the next thought. And that reminds me of something else that I'm irritated about. And I really don't like the way this is going. And frankly, I looked at the headlines today and I don't like the way that's going. And that irritates me. And that's why I'm in a mood. Now, the reason that you're in a mood from the Buddhist point of view is you're adding, up, throwing another log onto the fire. You are doing that. You see, it asks you to take res real responsibility there. It's not because something happened out there. It's because you're adding to the fire by the way that you're, by the way, you're, these thoughts are, mul are multiplying and then the body's responding. And now mind and body are in this cycle 
and it's going on and it's spinning and it's going on and it doesn't feel good, but I try not even to notice that it doesn't feel good. But the investigation here is notice, notice how it feels. Notice how it feels. Yeah. The very first investigation that the Buddha recommended is investigation into the dukkha that we are creating ourselves. Nobody else is in there. And we continue to, to, to reinforce thoughts and feelings that don't feel good. It's as simple as that. Except that when we notice that, it's like, well, clearly, is there, is there, is there another possible move here? Is there another possible move here? Well, one of the moves is to return to the holding environment, if you can do that, right? Sometimes we don't even want to do that. We just want to stay with it. It kind of grinds along. You know, you know those spaces. <clears throat> and it just grinds along. It kind of grinds along. And I know it doesn't feel good, but it just grinds along. And I'm not looking at it too much. And uh... the Buddha says, believe it or not, uh, there is a way through this. But we need to turn our attention more to it. More to it. More to what's actually going on in mind and body. Yeah. Uh, and as we as we attend more carefully to it, we're not quite as embroiled in it because there's a, there's a there's a mindfulness of seeing. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Look how this is going. Look how this is rolling along here. It's like it's like a nightmare that keeps getting worse. You know, like you ever been in those situation? You know, initially it was just a little thing that irritated me. And now I'm just completely irritated. Why did that happen? Well, because one thought after another, after another association, after another image, after another, uh, right? And suddenly we're in a mat. We're 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 in a state. You know, we're in a, we're in a in a more afflictive mind state. Yeah, yeah. So the hard, one of the hardest parts about investigation, it asks us to look more closely at stuff that doesn't feel good, especially the stuff that we are participating in, you know, directly. Yeah, yeah. Then there's also investigation, of course, into impermanence, which we've done a meditation on that together a few weeks ago. And it's another thing that we don't really want to look into too carefully. But that's another characteristic of existence. Again, having nothing to do with content. You see, none of these investigations have anything really to do with content. They have to do with direct experience and just directly seeing what's going on moment to moment. Yeah. One is how we, we participate in co-creating our own dukkha. And another, without fully being aware of how we're doing that or that we're doing that. And the other is, how we're continuing to try and reinforce some sense of continuity or solidity in our world, some some kind of predictability, some kind of certainty, some kind of some something that's really solid here. We said, okay, yeah, right, that's great. I mean, it's understandable. It is understandable that we do that. But one of the characteristics of existence is not the search for certainty. That's a characteristic of the self, search, searching for something certain. The characteristics of existence, if we look, start to look more closely, is that there's nothing permanent there at all. And the closer we look, the more impermanent it seems to be. And it's like, oh, okay, that's interesting cognitively, but maybe that's enough. I don't really want to look into that too much. And we don't. We don't. We don't. There's an uncomfortable feeling about it as we as meditation deepens a little bit. It's like, wait a second. You know, everything is slip sliding away here. Oh, how do I get comfortable with that? 
And of course, part of the direction of this practice is to get more comfortable with the fact that everything is changing moment to moment, but it's an acquired taste. And it's, it takes some investigation. It takes some willingness to look more closely into that because that's not the thing that we're co-creating. We are not creating impermanence. Impermanence is happening. That's not our imagination. It's happening constantly, right? And so that's another area of investigation. The investigation there is not, oh, I wonder why things are impermanent, but where did the world begin? How did all this start? No, that's another kind of theoretical, philosophical, sometimes a, a religious kind of, you know, what, the beginning of the, no, just notice, says the Buddha, moment to moment, how everything's changing. On the other side of that, with an acquired taste for that, there is another kind of comfort, another kind of ease that starts to arise in that when we start to become more in harmony with the reality that things are constantly changing and they will always be constantly changing. They will never stop constantly changing. And Bruce said, yeah, this is the real issue here is that we don't, we're not in harmony with the way things are in that respect. We continue to try to build a permanent, a sense of permanence, you know, a sense of permanence. So this is enough for today. You know, this is, um, you know, no, no, um, you know, not making a big deal uh, of, of, of these investigations, but they, it is important to know from time to time to begin to look more carefully in these ways, but not the content of our experience, but the structure of it, the underlying structure of it. And two of the most important pieces of that structure are dukkha and the way we create dukkha and impermanence and the way we're in denial of impermanence, basically at some level, you know, that we're wired to not see impermanence. Yeah. And then the Buddha said those are completely understandable, but they're not gonna lead us to the deeper kind of contentment that we're looking for. We need to get, turn our attention here and become, get more into harmony with the underpinnings of, of experience, with the, the major factors of experience there. Yeah. So let's meditate together. Opening up. And yeah, when you're ready, beginning to slow down. Lightly closing, closing the eyes. And orienting towards settling. You know, elongating the and expanding the breath a bit if it's helpful.
And as soon as possible, uh, along with settling, bringing caring attention
And if you like, for a few moments here, you could turn your attention to observing that everything that's going on in your meditation is changing. And you'll notice first, first notice this, that probably none of you are, have, were doing that prior to my just saying this, because it's not natural for us to, to investigate impermanence, to look at the changing nature moment after moment after moment. Oh, nothing's staying, gone, it's gone. Oh, it's changing, here for a minute, it's gone, it's gone. It's just not natural natural for us to go there, right? You know, if you like, you can notice that for a few moments. That sense that it doesn't matter what's there, just notice that it doesn't last. moment after moment. Something else arises and what was just there is gone. And even when it comes to impermanence, of course, we want to think about it. Oh, look at how impermanent everything is, which, of course, is natural. But it's just simply this. Whatever was there a moment ago is no longer there. It's gone. Whatever thought was there is gone. Coming and going. And so it can be useful from time to time to your own degree to turn your attention to this sometimes in your meditation. To begin to acquire a taste for it. I was like, oh, be comfortable with the flow of changing experience.
In our last few minutes of the meditation, settling back a bit more receptive attention. <clears throat> 